Hey, 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 good people. So you guys see I'm in my car. Uh, but nevertheless, we're going to get into uh, Second Kings. We're just going to do it live from my vehicle. Uh, I had some things pop up, and so I still wanted to do my live. I'm just going to do it from the car. And so I appreciate everyone that's going to be jumping on and uh, watching it. If you're just getting on again, I had some things pop up, so I'm going to have to do my live from my vehicle. But we're going to be in 2 Kings 24, and uh, I'm going to be talking about the topic that the enemy's persistence actually means you're a lot stronger than what you think. So again, we're going to be doing 2 Kings 24, and I'm going to be talking about the enemy's persistence uh, means you're stronger than what you think. Uh, a lot of times when the enemy... Uh, <laughs> You got jokes, Marcus. Uh, a lot of times when the enemy is persistent, you know, a lot of times we think that it is a sign uh, that something is wrong with us. And a lot of times it's not that there is a sign that something is wrong with you, um, but it, it it is a sign. And you're going to see this in the text that he's being persistent because you're actually way stronger than what you think you are. And so let's jump in it. I'm going to be in 2 Kings 24. I'm going to start off with uh, uh, verse 1. And it says, during uh, Jehoiakim's reign, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon invaded the land of Judah. And Jehoiakim surrendered and paid him tribute for three years, but then he rebelled. And so, again, it starts off, it says that uh, during the reign of Jehoiakim, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon invaded the land of Judah. Jehoiakim surrendered and paid him tribute for three years, but then he rebels. There is like way much more in this text, and you're going to see it when we get into Second Chronicles. Uh, I don't want to get into that now because we're actually going to really cover Second Chronicles. Uh, but something that stands out in this text to me as we're reading this is Jehoiakim is now the king um, in the land. So he's the new king. And the Bible talks about that, the uh, hey, Tiff, uh, it talks about that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar comes in and Jehoiakim pays him tribute, means that he's submitting up under um, King Nebuchadnezzar. So he gives King Nebuchadnezzar money. He's, he's doing what King Nebuchadnezzar is telling him to do, um, but he is the king. So I want you guys to see that just right off the bat, is that the same way King Nebuchadnezzar is king. Jehoiakim is king as well. But we have a king bowing down to another king, but they're in equal positions with equal titles. That is extremely interesting to me because one of the things when I started off reading this, again, we're in 2 Kings 24. If you're just jumping on, I'm just at verse one. I am in my car today, but it's going to be good. Don't worry about it. Uh, but one of the things that stood out to me in the text is that why is King Jehoiakim bowing down to another king and the Bible says that for three years while Jehoiakim was king that he paid tribute he 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 bowed down to King Nebuchadnezzar and basically was doing whatever it was that King Nebuchadnezzar wanted him to do and then it says at a certain period that Jehoiakim rebelled against um King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I said when I started off is that there is a lot in this text uh, that I'm not going to go into because we're actually going to cover it in 2 Chronicles. Um, but there's a lot missing in between verse 1 and verse 2. Uh, but one of the things that I want to just start off is that we want to make sure that we are not being a puppet, but that we are being led by the Holy Spirit or Christ on the inside of you. It is so easy to get around people and they have certain titles or, or they they have certain positions and then we become puppets where we're allowing people to manipulate us. We're allowing people to tell us what they think we should be doing. We have to not be puppets and we have to be led by the Holy Spirit. And so one of the things we see right here in verse one is that Jehoiakim is a king. King Nebuchadnezzar is a king, but Jehoiakim is not walking in his title as kingship. He is not leading the people. He is bowing down to another king. And, and when I started is studying this, um, the reason he was bowing down is because he thought because Nebuchadnezzar was over Babylon that he was more powerful than he was. But the reality is they both 
had titles of king. So there was no reason for him to bow down to this Babylonian king. And that's something we have to be careful as well, is that we don't take people's titles and, and where they are and start elevating people to a point where it's like we are bowing down because we think because they have these titles or they're in certain positions that they're greater. That doesn't mean that they're greater. And so one of the things that we see is he is bowing down. Hey, what's up, Tanya? He is bowing down to this king that has the same title that he has. And so point number one I said is that we want to be careful that we are not people's puppets, that we are being led by Holy Spirit or Jesus Christ on the inside of you. We want to make sure that we're not being puppets, that we're not being manipulated because we have exalted people and we think that they are higher than we are. And so we, it, we can easily um, start being manipulated or being puppeted by people. And so it's just something that, that I found very interesting is that a king is bowing down to another king. All right, let's keep going. We're going to do verses two through four. Then the Lord sent bands of Babylonian, a man, Mobite, and Ammonite raiders against Judah to destroy it. And just as the Lord had promised through his prophets, these disasters happened to Judah because of the Lord's command. And he had decided to banish Judah from his presence because of the many sins of Manasseh, who had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would not forgive this. And so here we go. Um, God, all of a sudden, and now these people that I just called out were all under King Nebuchadnezzar. They were Babylonian armies. They were just in different parts. So God permits King Nebuchadnezzar's armies to attack Judah all because of the sins of Manasseh. So we know, I think it was Aaron uh, uh, covered Manasseh again, even on last night, just giving a recap. But God permitted these different armies to come in and attack uh, Judah all because of the sins of Manasseh. And so something that I wrote down is that really when you look at these wicked kings. I want you to, as, as we have been covering this, I want you to think about this. When you look at these wicked kings, the reason God permitted the enemy to attack them was really all he wanted was for Judah to repent and turn to him. All he wanted was for these kings to repent and be led by him as the king of kings. And so you see where God uh, permits these enemies to attack uh, his people, but all because he wanted to turn his people back to him. What am I saying is a lot of times God will permit things. And so we know, I said this as an example a few weeks ago, is that the enemy is like a bulldog on a leash. He can only do, and you see that in Job. If you don't believe me, go back and look at the story of Job. The enemy was coming to God and, and the devil was asking God, you know, about attacking Job. And then God gives him certain parameters. This is what you can do. You can do this, but you can't do this. And so sometimes we exalt the enemy like he has all this power. And so what we see in the text is that uh, God is permitting the enemies to attack Job. Judah, but I want you to see why God is permitting it. He's permitting it because he's trying to turn the hearts of his people back to him. God is a merciful God. He is a gracious God. He loves his people. And so these wicked kings are in position, but it does not stop God for trying to still draw them back to him. And so he allows these enemies to come and attack because of the sins of Manasseh. But God is not sending these enemies to attack just because he's trying to demolish Judah. If God wanted to wipe out his people, he could have easily wiped out his people because he's an all-powerful God. The reason God was taking his time is that he was still trying to draw his people back to him. And, and what am I saying is point number two is that God will permit things, whatever it takes for you to be fully reliant upon him. Uh, God will permit things, whatever it takes for you to be fully reliant upon him. He'll permit certain things in your life. We see in the text that God permits these Babylonian armies to attack Judah. The reason he permitted it is because he was trying to draw his people. He was trying to get these wicked kings to turn back to him. And if that meant that God had to press his 
thumbprint on his people to put a little pressure, but to draw them back, then God was going to do that. And so point number two is God will permit certain things, uh, whatever it takes for you to get fully reliant upon him. I've had many things in my life. I've had money. I've had people walk away. I've had money disappear. I've lost jobs all because if I was putting my attention in something more than God and I was exalted up, if I was lifting it above God, um, then what God would do is he would push his thumbprint on me just so I could turn back to him. I know, Marcus, I read both of our chapters and they actually could have went together. Uh, but God will permit certain things because he's trying to get you to draw back to him. And so he allows these Babylonian armies to attack Judah. But the underlying reason is he really was trying to still give these kings a chance to turn back to him. So let's keep going. Uh, let's read five through seven. And it says the rest of the events in Jehoiakim's reign and all his deeds are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. And when Jehoiakim died, his son Joachim became the next king. Um, and then verse seven says the king of Egypt did not venture out. So this is talking about Jehoiachin. It says the king of Egypt did not venture out of his country after that. For the king of Babylon, so that's talking about Nebuchadnezzar, he captured the entire area formally and claimed by the Egypt from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River. And so again, let me say this. There is a lot in this in Second Chronicles. I don't want to jump there, but it seems like this story is moving very fast and it's actually not. So when we get in Second Chronicles, you guys are going to see way more meat in this context. But what happens is Jehoiakim dies. So he rebels against uh, the king of Nebuchadnezzar. So first he was submitting to Nebuchadnezzar. Then he rebels against Nebuchadnezzar uh, after attacking a few times. And, and, and then it talks about that he dies. And then all of a sudden, his son, Jehoiachin, Jehoiachin, is on the scene. And the Bible says Jehoiachin did not venture out of his country after that. For the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, captured the entire area formerly claimed by Egypt. And so I, I was reading this and I was like, this is crazy. Okay, so King Jehoiachin died. That Jehoiakim, uh, he dies. He's off the scene. Here comes his son. And, and again, they have the title king. I want you to see this. The same title that Nebuchadnezzar has, they have just in a different area. And so they're both kings, but they're both operating very differently. Nebuchadnezzar is walking in his authority and power as king. He is dominating. He is leading Babylon. He is taking over Judah. And then you have, now you look at Judah. And you look at Jehoiakim, and he didn't do what was right in the Lord's sight, and then he submitted to King Nebuchadnezzar, and then there's a point where it says, okay, he rebelled, and then he dies, he's off the scene, and then here comes his son, and the Bible says that his son did not even venture out. His son just stayed in the in the town uh, uh, like a captive, even though he was a king. I find that very disturbing, that he is a king, but he is not acting like a king. He is not walking like a king um, and then really if he would turn to God he actually was more powerful than the Babylonian king and so one of the things I put as point number three is tap into your superpower not just when you need it but all of the time the Jesus on the inside of you I want to give you guys some background that I was studying today I wanted to know why did King Nebuchadnezzar why was he so persistent it when it came to Judah. And a lot of my research that I did today, it talked about that Judah was uh, strategically positioned. And so Judah was actually right close to Assyria. And so King Nebuchadnezzar felt threatened by Judah because he felt like if Judah would actually tap into the surrounding towns that was around them, then they would have been too powerful for him to take over. And so the reason he's putting pressure on Judah and 
that he's trying to get these kings to surrender and submit to him is they're actually way stronger than what they think. They just don't know it. If they would have paired up with some of these surrounding towns and really tapped into God, uh, 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 actually become one with the God who was putting pressure on them to turn back to him, they were way stronger than the, than the Babylonian king. But that's how the enemy works. He throws a lot of threats. He puts a lot of pressure out there because he wants you to bow out. He wants you to give up before you ever really tap into the greater one on the inside of you. The Bible says that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The enemy wants you to bow out before you ever tap into your purpose, before you ever surrender to God, before you ever become one with your purpose, before you ever really be who God called you to be, before you ever make an impact, before you ever live right, before you ever do any of that, before you ever build your children, he wants you to bow down. Why? Because if he can get you to bow down before you ever tap into it, then he conquers you and you are no longer a threat to him. That's why I titled this, that because the enemy is persistent, you are way stronger than what you think. His persistence is a sign that you are stronger. And so what's happening is the enemy is attacking Judah because Judah is actually stronger than what they know. These kings are actually way stronger than what they think. But the Bible says that King Joachim, he bowed out before he ever started being king. He had already, he had already surrendered to the Babylonian king. And I'll tell you why, because his daddy bowed out. And so because his daddy bowed out, he followed in the in the same footsteps of bowing out to King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar knew that if he would bow out, that as long as he was king, he would be a puppet. He would do every single thing that King Nebuchadnezzar wanted him to do. Why? Because he was afraid. And 2 Timothy talks about that God is not giving you the spirit of fear. The reason the enemy pumps fear in the lives of believers is he never wants them to tap into the power that comes with faith. The power that comes with really relying on God. See, if God becomes our crutch, like a pair of crutches when you break a leg, then that means God is guiding you. God is leading you. The enemy doesn't want that. He wants you to be self-reliant. He wants you to be people reliant. He wants you to be job reliant. He wants you to be cash reliant, money reliant. He don't ever want you to tap into the power that comes when you are fully surrendered to Jesus Christ, when you are fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit. He don't want you to do that because when you become like that, you become a threat to him even more. And so what he does is he tries to get you to punk out. He tries to get you to bow down because if you bow down and you don't really surrender to Christ, you don't really become who God called you to be, then you're not a threat to him. You don't take him out. You don't snatch nobody from the kingdom of hell. And so he don't want you to do that. And so he pumps fear. He pumps fear. He pumps fear so that you don't do anything because you're so afraid to operate in purpose. You're so afraid to stand up for this Bible. You're so afraid. And so we see this with this king. This king Jehoiachin has bowed out even before he ever was king. He had already bowed out because he saw his daddy bow out. And so here it is. He's going to reign for 11 years and he is surrendered to this Babylonian king. I want you guys to hear that. He was a king just like King Nebuchadnezzar. Don't read this text and think that Nebuchadnezzar was just so powerful. He wasn't. They both were kings. One had just surrendered uh, uh, to what he was called to be. And so he felt like he was king. And so he was going to dominate. And, and Judah was actually great. And he knew Judah was great. And so he was trying to put pressure on them before they ever tapped into really what God was trying to get them to tap into. Let's keep going. Uh, verses 8 through 12. And it says that Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother was Nehushta and the daughter of El Nathan from Jerusalem. And Jehoiachin did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his father did. So I told you guys, he was doing just like his daddy did. And Jehoiachin's reign, the officers of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came up against Jerusalem and besieged it. And Nebuchadnezzar himself arrived at the city during the siege. Then King Jehoiachin, along with the queen, 
his mother, his advisors, his commanders, and his officials surrendered to the Babylonians. In the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, he took Jehoshaphat uh, Jehoiachin prisoner. So here is this king, now a prisoner of another king. But it all started out because he was afraid up front. And so now it says, as the Lord, uh, no, I'll stop right there. And so, okay, so here we go. Uh, king Jehoiachin has now become a prisoner of, of, of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And so he takes him as prisoner. And the Bible says that not only does he take him, he takes all of the people connected to him as well. See, that, that's how the enemy works. I want you guys to get this, man. I was delivered from fear so I can preach fear because I know what fear does. Fear keeps you in bondage. The Bible says that there is no liberty in fear. And as long as you give in to fear. Somebody's watching, you're like, oh, well, I'm not afraid with nightlights and stuff. Uh, then that, I'm not talking about that. You can be afraid to operate in purpose. You can be afraid to step out and, and God's telling you to leave a job. You can be afraid to get married. You can be afraid to have children. I mean, fear is pumped in so many aspects and the enemy knows that with fear is bondage. God is a God of faith. He wants us to be reliant upon him. But what the enemy does is he pumps fear so much because the more you embrace fear, the greater the grip of the enemy becomes. And he puts you in this prison. And what happens is, is you're already free because the Bible says that Christ has set you free. And so uh, with love, perfect love, cast out fear. But what happens is as long as you're in fear, it's like the enemy puts you in prison. And, and you really have a key to walk out. But what happens is you're in that prison and, 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 and it's already unlocked. But you're sitting in there because that's how fear works. It pumps it. It makes it so so big when it's really not that big. It stresses you out so much when it's really not that stressful. But as long as he can keep pumping fear. And so what we see in this text is that now King Nebuchadnezzar has this king. This king is reigning and King Nebuchadnezzar has come in and he has taken over. He didn't take over his mama. He didn't take over the officers. He took the advisors. He got the commanders. He didn't take it over everybody. Why? Because he knew Judah was great. And so he needed this king to surrender to him. He needed this king to bow down to him. Why? Because God was trying to get the king to bow down to him. But King Nebuchadnezzar wanted him to bow down. We know that because that's familiar in the story of Daniel. I'm not going to get into that, but just think about your little Bible stories. What did he want? Want. He wanted worship. He wanted worship. He wanted people to bow down. And you see that in this text. It didn't start in Daniel. Here he is again. He wants this king to bow down to him because he does not want him to bow down to the true living God, uh, 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 which was what God was doing. God was trying to get these kings to stop being wicked, man, and just surrender to him. But we see in this text where um, Jehoiakim is like a punk, man. He is just completely surrendered over to this king, even though he had a title, he had the same title, same rights, same position. He has surrendered over to this king and it's not good, man, because now the king is kind of taking over. And so uh, point number four is keep the fight. The enemy's persistence is a sign that you are much stronger than you think. I, I, you can watch this and be like, I don't think I'm that strong. You're right. You're not without Jesus Christ. The Bible says uh, um, um, that he is our strength. He's Jehovah Tashur, the God of our strength. So in yourself, you are not strong. But the Bible says that in, in your weakness, he is made strong. So you're stronger than what you think because of him, not because of you. In you, like me, you are weak and you can't do nothing. But when you tap into your superpower, uh, uh, Jesus Christ, then you are strong. So you got to keep the fight, man. The enemy, there's been so much going on the past few weeks with me. It, it has been crazy things. The enemy has been attacking it, and I know he's been attacking it. But I also know that God has been permitted it because there's something God is trying to get me to see. And so he never permits something without a purpose. There's a reason why he permits it. We've got to seek him regarding the purpose. And so there's been a lot of crazy.
crazy things going on the past few weeks. And I know I was telling someone who texted me this yesterday. The enemy wants me to quit because he knows as I operate in purpose that I'm snatching people out of the kingdom of hell. He knows as I operate in purpose that I'm pulling somebody out of depression. As I operate in purpose that I'm encouraging the believer to keep doing what God has called him. And so I'm a threat to him. And so because I'm a threat, he's going to launch all kinds of stuff. And God's going to permit it. Why? Because the enemy wants me to quit. He wants me to give up. Why am I saying that? Because I'm saying that to you, man. The enemy throws all kind of stuff. Your, your car stopped working. The people at the job acting crazy. Your kids acting up. Your money kind of funny. All this stuff. You could have just got promoted. Then all of a sudden, all kind of stuff starts acting up. Why? Because the enemy wants you to quit just like this king. He's He put the pressure on these kings. And then all of a sudden, this king Jehoiachin has bowed completely out. He has surrendered all over to Nebuchadnezzar. That's what the enemy's trying to do. He puts a lot of pressure because he wants you to quit. And I'm telling you, don't do it. God ain't no punk. We don't serve no punk God. He is great. He is mighty. All you need to do is stop resisting. Stop being self-reliant. Stop being depend uh, people reliant and just depend 100% on God. And I'm telling you, God has got your back. We got to stop reading this word and not believing it. If God said you got John uh, 4 or 4, I believe, uh, he talks about that the, the greater one is on the inside of you. If he's on the inside of you, then it's time that you believe it and you got to stop bowing down. You got to stop going in these emotional rants and, and, and being all over the place. No, you got to start tapping into your superpower. Um, a lot of times, and I'm going to tell you guys a little secret. So a lot of times when I look at myself, uh, I like superhero mo movies. Uh, a lot of times when I look at myself, I feel like Clark Kent. I feel like when I look at me, I'm not that strong. When I look at me, I see all these issues. When I look at me, I'm like, man, I need to get this together and this together. But man, when I get in that booth, whew, and I tap into who God made me to be, and I tap into the God on the inside of me, then when I come out, I'm like Supergirl. I got an S on my chest. I'm feeling strong. Why? Not because of my own strength, but because of him, because of who he is. When I look at me, I don't feel that strong. When I look at sometimes I wake up and my attitude's just not the greatest, then I don't feel like Supergirl. I don't feel like Superwoman. I feel like Clark Kent. I feel like Pee Wee Herman. I feel like my strength is not that great. My my attitude is not that great, but man, when I tap into the God on the inside of me and I get up out that booth, then yes, I'm a threat to the enemy. Why? Because now he like, uh oh, she didn't tap into the God on the inside of her. There's nothing I can do to her without the permission of God. And so it's like, man, you got, yeah, I feel something, B. <laughs> you got to tap into the, the power that's within you, man. You got to keep your fight. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what the enemy's throwing. And he could throw the whole kitchen sink. Your whole everything could be falling apart, man. You got to keep your fight and you got to keep your reliance upon God. One of the things that has helped me, and I'm going to be very honest, I've had a rough couple weeks, but one of the things that has helped me these past couple weeks, listen to me, I'm telling you this, has been my relationship with God. God shows me how to navigate through what is coming in my life. He shows me how to, he gives me specific direction on how to navigate through the stress, how to navigate through different pressures of life, different things. I don't know what everybody else relies on. I rely on my relationship with God. So what am I telling you is when it gets crazy and you want to go off and you want to give people a little, little piece of your mind, <laughs> you want to you want to say a few words to folks and things. I'm telling you to rely on the God that is in you. Ask God for wisdom. The Bible says if you lack wisdom, he'll give it to you. Uh, but you got to tap into that, not into you, because what happens is <laughs> a lot of times we want to tap into us. And, and, and just go off. I'm, I'm saying, no, don't do that. Just tap into the God on the inside of you and let God navigate you through um, this emotionally trying time or whatever you're going through. Let's keep going. We're going to we're almost out of here. 13 through 17. And uh, 
As the Lord had said before, Nebuchadnezzar carried away all the treasures from the Lord's temple and the royal palace. He stripped away all the gold, all the objects that King Solomon of Israel had placed in the temple. King Nebuchadnezzar took all Jerusalem captive, including the commanders and the best of the soldiers, the craftsmen and, and the artisans and 10,000 and on. Only the poorest people were left. This guy is, is out of line. He, only the poorest people were left in the land. And Nebuchadnezzar led King Joachim away as a captive to Babylon, along with his mother, his wives, the officials, Jerusalem's elite. Uh, he also exiled 7,000 of the best troops and 1,000 craftsmen and artisans, and all of whom were strong and fit to war. Listen to this again. I want you to hear this. He exiled, he banished 7,000 of the best troops, 1,000 craftsmen and artisans, all of whom was strong and fit for war. Verse 17, then the king of Babylon installed uh, Mataniah, Jehoiachin's uncle, as the next king, and he changed Mataniah's name to Zedekiah. So, you guys, I'm going to beat this point because I want you to see this. Why did this man feel the need to banish or exile 7,000 of the strong warriors, 1,000 of the artisans, and 1,000 of the craftsmen? Because they were strong. That's what I'm telling you. These kings did not know what they have. They did not know that not only physically were they strong, strategically, this, this part of the country was positioned in a very great place. Then they had God if they would have just turned to what God was trying to get them to get. They were way stronger than what they thought. That's how the enemy is. You are way stronger than what you think. You think you're about to lose it. You think if one more thing happens, but you just ain't gone. You just finna go off. No, I'm telling you, you are way stronger than what you think. The only thing that King Nebuchadnezzar needed was for Jehoiachin to surrender. See, at least his father fought for a while. He may have been out of line, but he fought. Jehoiachin had already bowed down when he first started being king. The Bible says he didn't even go out anymore. So all he needed was him to surrender. Why is the enemy putting pressure on you? Because he wants you to surrender. I'm telling you, he wants you to quit. He wants you to lose it. He wants you to think you're bipolar. He wants you to think you're all over the place. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying anything against people who have been diagnosed with that. I'm just saying that the enemy wants you to think you're losing it. He wants you to think you can't do it. And I'm telling you, you can't without God. He needed Jehoiachin to bow down so that he could come in, man, and, and, and demolish this, this town. He needed him to bow down so he could exile all the strong people. And, and why do you think he left the poor people? Because he felt like they were no longer a threat to him. So he needed to come in and, and burn this city up. That's pretty much what he's doing. He needed to demolish the temple. He needed to take everything so that they could not tap into God and so that, that there was no power that they had he needed he needed to do that why because it, it fed his ego was that you you're nothing you're nothing I could come in and just take over but he could not have done that until this king bowed down and surrendered what am I saying to you man you are stronger than what you think there's a king and a queen that lives in all of us God is on the inside of us. God has made you way stronger than what you think and when the enemy starts attacking it's because he wants you to think that you're not he wants you to think you're crazy and he wants you to surrender. When, 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 when this king surrendered, you saw it just got 10 times worse. He didn't even do that with his daddy. But because he bowed down and surrendered, it gave that king permission to come in and just take over. So point number five, and this is my last point, is that no matter how bad it gets, man, never surrender to the enemy. You guys hear me say this all the time. I'm going to go out fighting. Oh, oh, oh I'm never. I, I used to fight in school. Listen. I ain't never surrendered to the enemy. Never. And I never will. Just I'm just on the other side. Now I'm saved. Back then I wasn't saved, but I still didn't surrender. If I was going to fight, I was going to go out fighting. I could have been beat up. I'm still going to be I'm still going to be trying to fight in some way. I ain't never bowed down. I ain't never laid on the ground and cried and gave up. No. I oh, it's going to be it's something in me going to fight. And I've always been that way. And so now that I'm saved, I'm the same way. I ain't finna be whining. 
I don't care what you throwing. I ain't finna bow down and surrender to you. No, heck no. I belong to God. So I am not surrendering to you. I'm not giving up. I'm not throwing in a towel. I'm going to rely 100% on God. And that's what I'm telling you guys. Don't give up, man. You got to have a fight. Something in you got to rise up and you got to fight and you got to be like, nah, I ain't no punk. Yeah, I said that. I ain't no punk. You got to say that. Nah, I ain't bowing down. I don't care what come. I'm going to trust the father. I'm going to lean on him and not on my own understanding. Last few verses and we out. Uh, 18 through 20. And it says Zedekiah was 21 years old. Uh, when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years, his mother was Hamuchul, the daughter of Jeremiah from Libna. But Zedekiah did what was evil in the Lord's sight. Nothing new. And just as Jehoiakim had done, these things happened because the Lord's anger against the people of Jerusalem and J Judah. The Lord's anger was against the people of Jerusalem and Judah until he finally banished them from his presence and sent them into exile. Man, I, I want you to hear this um, as I was reading this um, and, and God was just downloading some things to me. One of the things I realize is, you know, as we study these kings and Marcus is going to end us in second kings on tomorrow. But one of the things I realize is that God, like when you read the end of this and it says God's anger was kindled to a point that God exiled them. And what, what, what basically happened is God let King Nebuchadnezzar just come in and do his thing. Um, why? Because God is gracious. He is loving. He is always pursuing you. And so in the Old Testament, there there was no savior. There was no Jesus Christ. And so God is pursuing these kings. He's pursuing these, these nations. Like, I love you. Turn to me. Do my will. Do what I've called you to do. And you see, they're just constantly like, yeah, no, nah, I'm just going to do what I want to do. No, nah, I'm going to do what I want to do. And then you see towards this ladder, when Jerusalem is about to fall, it is that God is still pursuing because that's how he is. He's still pursuing you, even though you stink, even though you he's pursuing you. You ain't getting it all together. You ain't got it. He's still pursuing. That's how he is. But it's like you see at the end of this, God's like, you know what? I'm, I'm just tired. I'm just going to go on and just, I'm, I'm going to go and let you guys be exiled. Why? Because it was like God had pursued them so much. He had, he was constantly giving them, I mean, look how many wicked kings rule. If you've just been with us the past few weeks. Look how many wicked kings ruled and they still, I want you to hear this because this is, this is truth. They all could have turned. They all had a decision. See, sometimes we preach it like they didn't have a decision and God just forced them to be wicked. No, he didn't. They all had choices. They just chose to be wicked. And, 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 and you see that in the scripture. They Just because their daddy did it didn't mean they had to do it. They could have turned. Uh, we see a strict difference between Jehoiakim, uh, Jehoiakim and Jehoiachim. Jehoiakim was fighting Nebuchadnezzar, but then his son turned around and just laid down and just let him do whatever uh, to a point that the, the king just took all over. And then here's his uncle coming in and the only reason Nebuchadnezzar put his uncle in is because his uncle was even more weak than the previous king and so he put him in position so he could just rule him as well too and so what am I saying as I end this man the, God loves you. You guys hear me say this all the time, but it's true. God loves you, man. He is never going to stop pursuing you. He is never going to stop trying to get you to do his will. He is never going to stop trying to get you to do his purpose. That's the benefit of having Jesus Christ die on that cross is that God sent a savior for us. We were all jacked up. But he sent a savior for us. And, and through that savior, man, we can have eternal life. He is always going to be pursuing us all the way until our last breath. He's going to be pursuing us. And, and I want you to hear that there could be many things going on in your life. That does not stop the fact that God loves you. That does not stop the fact that God cares about you. God, I just look at him like such an amazing father. He knows what it takes to stretch his children. He knows just, just how much, um, I, I, you guys hear me references, but it always makes me think of lifting weights. God knows how much pressure to put on that bar and you're all struggling. You're like, I can't do it. I can't do it. And God like, just put a few more 25s on there. I think you got it. Why? Because he knows what he's trying to develop you into. He knows what he's trying to pull up out of you. And so, so he going to put the pressure on there because you cannot grow. Listen to what I'm saying. You cannot grow without pressure. You cannot grow without weight. Sometimes we want it easy and you're going to have summer seasons is what I call it. In them summer seasons, man, it's going to be light and fluffy. 
You're going to be eating cotton candy. It's going to seem like the enemy is far away. And, and you're going to be on the beach just enjoying it. And, and then comes fall. And, and stuff start falling away in the fall. Why? Because you need those seasons to develop you. You need those seasons to build you. This Christian walk ain't easy. They lied to us when they said that. Um, but you have a Savior, man, that's there. You have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. And God is right there. But but there's going to be pressure. And life is going to kick in. And all of those things. Why? Because God needs to develop you. He don't want you to be two when you're 32. He wants you to be 32 and, and, and have the maturity of a 32-year-old. He don't want you to still be throwing temper tantrums at 40. And so what he does is when we throw them temper tantrums, he like, cool, I know what to do in order to grow you. I know, I know just what to send to stretch you. Um, you're not relying on me? Cool. I know just what to send to stretch you a little more. That is the faithfulness of our father. They give tests in school. Why? Because they want to make sure that what they've been teaching, that you have been listening and that you can pass the test to show as a sign that not only have you been listening, but it is ingrained in you to a point that you can recite it on a test. That's how God is. God, God permits certain stuff um, because he knows how strong you are. He knows what he put on the inside of you. And I want you to see it like that. God is trying to get you from A to B. You may want to skate from A to B, but God knows what it takes for you to get from A to B. He knows what it takes to get you there. So you want the easy route. You want God to give you a little airplane and you just glide to B. And God like, no, you're going to be walking, bro, between A and B because I need you uh, to be stronger. I need you to be reliant upon me. I don't need you to rely on you. And for some of you, you've been too reliant on people. So God start moving, folks, because he's like, I, I know what it takes to get you. See, see, he's your father. So uh, for all my people that got children, you know what that's like. You know your kids. So you know what it takes to get your children in line. For some of them, it's a look. For some of them, it's that good old belt. For some of them, it's in the corner. For some of them, it's take all electronic devices. But you're such an amazing parent that you know your child enough to know exactly what to do to get your child in line. That's how it is with God. He knows each and every one of us. So, Ma, what I'm going through may be different than what you're going through. But I want you to know is, is that he's, he's allowing the enemy to do certain stuff because you're way stronger than what you think. And you see that all throughout this text. All these kings was attacking Judah and Jerusalem. They were doing all kind of crazy stuff. Why? Because they were stronger than what they thought. All these, these wicked, I almost said dumb kings, but all these wicked kings needed to do was just surrender to God. Just surrender. And God had their back. So let's pray. Father, you're an amazing God. There's nobody like you, God. You're so wonderful. You're such an amazing father. You know what it takes, God, to draw us closer to you. You even know what it takes to make us more like you. Sometimes we think we look like you, but you know what it takes just to get us up out of us so that we can look more like you. So our attitude can resemble you. You know what kind of pressure to put on us to make us love more like you. Father, I know how amazing you are. I thank you for every person on this video. May they know how amazing you are. May they know how wonderful you are. May they not take the pressure, God, as a sign that they did something wrong. May they not take the pressure, God, as a sign that, 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 that they can't handle it. But may they know that the pressure that comes in life is so our dependency can be 100% on you. So that, that we're not relying 100% on people and money and jobs and putting all our faith and hope in those things. All those things will pass away. But God, may we put our hope and trust in you, the only thing that is eternal. God, may our faith be in you. May we know that no matter what life sins, no matter what we go through, that Father, you are right there, man. <laughs> you said in your word, one of my favorite scriptures is that you'll never leave us, nor will you forsake us. Father, even when it's hard, man, even when life is hitting us and, and all these things are attacking our bodies, God, you are right there and you are faithful. And so, Father, I pray for someone today that may be feeling discouraged. May the strength of the Lord come. May, may you lift their head, God. You are the lifter of our heads. Father, may Jehovah Teshua show up, the God of, of their strength. May they know, Father, that you are right there when they're frustrated. You're right there when they're stressed. And you're just, you're just waiting to talk to them. 
May they not just talk to everyone else, but may they talk to you and may they be honest with how they feel and know that you know it. You said that there was nothing that we went through in Hebrews that you didn't already go through. And so, Father, I thank you for that today. I thank you that you are our encouragement, God. You are the strength of our lives. You're the lover of our soul. Everything we need is in you. And though we read about these kings, God, and they didn't turn to you, may we always turn to you. May we always lay our weaknesses at your feet. May we know that when we are weak, you are strong, Father. And I just pray that somebody will be encouraged watching this today, Father. Lastly, I pray for my brother Marcus. I cover him in the blood of Jesus Christ. God, strengthen him to do the work that you called him to do on tomorrow, God. I pray that you would speak through him. I pray that you would be his mouthpiece. May you lead and guide him in the text, God. May he only say what it is that you want him to say. May fresh revelations come. God, may you share not only this word for his life, but for the lives of others that will watch him on tomorrow. And Father, I just thank you that no matter what comes today, let it not be a distraction for him, Father. But I pray for singleness of vision, God, that he will be focused tonight and focused when he gets on that video tomorrow. God, be his strength, be his encouragement, be the lifter of his head. And Father, I just thank you for that. May he feel your overwhelming love tonight. And even as he does this video on tomorrow. And Father, we just give you all glory. We give you all praise in Jesus' name. Peace.